Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Vertical Space, a podcast at the intersection of technology and flight. We are your hosts, Jim Barry and Luka Tomjanovic, and here we look at the most important forces shaping the market of advanced air mobility, with a particular focus on why and how they matter to those building a business in this very exciting and growing industry. So like most engineering problems, you always want to start with requirements for your system. But for an area that's got new technologies and is a new space where there really aren't established players, it's a little bit of an art to set those requirements because you don't really 100% know what the market is. You usually want to start with some hypothesis about high level trends in the world and where there's friction that you want to try and eliminate which is all of what advanced air mobility, urban air mobility is about. Then you couple that with a technology assessment, you know, an understanding of what's possible today uh, based on R&D kind of at the more fundamental piece part levels, what's possible in the future. And then you can kind of make a decision on where you want to lie on that spectrum. Welcome back to the vertical space. Today's conversation is with Jeff Bauer. Chief Engineer at Archer Aviation, a developer of electric vertical takeoff and landing or eVTOL aircraft. Jeff is one of the most renowned engineers in the eVTOL arena, and we sat down for an in-depth discussion on developing and commercializing eVTOL aircraft. We started the conversation with a high-level description of a day in the life of a chief engineer of a pioneering aircraft company, which then sets the stage for a discussion about the assumptions and design trade-offs that Jeff and his team faced when figuring out the requirements for an aircraft and mission for which there is really no historical precedent to rely on. One of my favorite parts of the conversation is when Jeff talks about the design and development tools, including multidisciplinary optimization and simulation tools developed internally at Archer, that were used to arrive at what Jeff calls productivity requirements of payload range and speed, as well as other requirements related to the infrastructure footprint, turnaround time, manufacturability, maintainability, and many others. You will also hear from Jeff about the reasons for going with a battery electric and piloted configuration, as opposed to an autonomous aircraft with a hybrid or perhaps hydrogen propulsion system. You'll hear about the economics of EV tolls and a deep dive into the certification process, system safety process, as well as differences between the FAA and the ASA when it comes to probabilities for catastrophic failure conditions. With over a decade of experience in the EV tall aircraft industry, Jeff has helped design and built five previous generations of full-scale EV tall aircraft. Before joining Archer, Jeff was chief engineer for Project Bahana at A-Cubed, an Airbus Innovation Center in Silicon Valley, where he led the engineering team that designed, built, and completed a successful flight test campaign for the Bahana demonstrator. Before Bahana, he worked on flight control system development and aerodynamic modeling at Zero. Jeff holds a master's and PhD in aerospace engineering from Stanford University and a BS degree from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Enjoy the conversation with Jeff after a brief sponsor message. This episode of the Vertical Space Podcast is brought to you by UAvionics. UAvionics is the leader in low size, weight and power certified avionics for manned, unmanned and advanced air mobility aircraft. Let UAvionics help you achieve your goals, whether that be type certification, airspace access or beyond visual line of sight operations. UAvionics has certified and certifiable communications, navigation and surveillance avionics for your aircraft. So head over to uavionics.com or Google it to see how you can start flying safer and move your platform forward into shared airspace. Jeff, we are very happy to have you on the show. Welcome to the Vertical Space. Thanks. It's really nice to be here. So the first question we ask is, is there anything that very few in the industry agree with you on? Yeah, so I think everybody in the industry has a little bit of a different approach to this emerging market. So here at Archer, we're really focused on you know achieving the most efficient path to commercialization. And that's really shaped a lot of the uh, decisions that we've made as a company. So starting with the design and development of our you know recently unveiled production aircraft, Midnight, we we decided we wanted it to be a piloted aircraft because you know the the FAA hasn't really set out a path yet for for autonomous or unmanned aircraft that are carrying people. Also, we're taking an approach where we engage very early with the FAA to, to understand all the design requirements rather than designing an airplane and then going to the FAA and trying to get it certified. So it's kind of this mindset, strategic mindset, 
of this pragmatic approach to commercialization that I think sets us apart. And it's not the path that everybody else in the industry is taking. So you think that this is a path that very few agree with you on and most of the industry would say that this is not a good idea? <laughs> I don't know that it's necessarily not a good idea, but I think a lot of the others are focused on the technologies and pushing those, which is great for you know Im improving some of the typical performance metrics, which will be important over time. But we're really focused on what we can do today with uh, existing technologies. So Jeff, with your pragmatic approach, what are the two or three things that you're doing that are most unique versus the others? Uh, so I think the the first is we're we're really trying to leverage the existing supply chain. Uh, as it exists for technologies that don't need to be new and novel for these aircraft. So, you know, we're working with established suppliers of avionics systems. Uh, we've announced our, you know, a partnership with Garmin for that. Our environmental control system and actuators, we're working with Honeywell. On the airframe side, our material supplier is Hexel. So we're not, you know, we're not trying to uh, invent new technologies in some of these areas. We're really focusing our efforts internally on the overall aircraft design and those technologies that will separate the performance of these vehicles. So namely the, the powertrain and flight control system. Now, Jeff, you are one of the most highly regarded, most respected engineers in the eVTOL space. What does a day in the life of a chief engineer at an advanced eVTOL manufacturer look like? That's a really good question. So uh, one of the things I really love about my job here is that every day is a bit different. So there's new challenges, new problems to solve. I would say I spend the vast majority of my time working closely with our engineering team to do things like trade studies, go between different design options, attending design reviews and program reviews, uh, meeting with our suppliers and their engineering teams. And then I do, it's not the fun part of the job, but definitely spend a lot of time reviewing engineering documents and uh, approving them. So, you know, design and stress analysis reports, safety documents, requirements, certification plans, those sorts of things. What aspect of it do you enjoy the most? I really like the, the trade studies. So mm -hmm. it's where you get to be creative. You know, you have a problem, you need to find a solution to it. Yeah, that, those, are the, those are the parts of the, the job I love. Great. And we'll, we'll get back to that because that is an interesting one. But, you know, let's say that the three of us get together and say that we want to start our own eVTOL company. How does one begin designing a new aircraft from a complete blank sheet of paper? Uh, one that is not only a new design, but it also incorporates multiple new technologies that in that particular combination has never been certified before or even individually in certain instances. So how have you developed this instinct and how do you approach this design problem? So like most engineering problems, you always want to start with requirements for your system before, you know, an area that's got new technologies and is a new space where there really isn't aren't established players. It's a little bit of an art to to set those requirements because you don't really 100% know what the market is. So you usually want to start with some hypothesis about, you know, high level trends in the world and where there's friction that you want to try and eliminate, which is what all, all of what advanced air mobility, urban air mobility is about. Then you couple that with a technology assessment. So, you know, an understanding of what's possible today uh, based on R&D kind of at the more fundamental piece part levels, what's possible in the future. And then you can kind of make a decision on where you want to lie on that spectrum, right? Do you want to do you want to be using the cutting edge technology that maybe carries higher risk or sticking to the, the known things that are less risky? And that's, again, set by this market, those macro trends. And so to using the example of Archer, you know, there, there really are some undeniable trends we've seen, like increasing urbanization throughout the world, increasing traffic congestion in major cities, this move towards sustainable energy and need to reduce harmful emissions in cities as well. So, you know, pollutants, particulates in the air, those sorts of things. And we've also seen the advancements in technology over the last couple of decades. So lithium ion batteries and electric motors, which have really been driven by the automotive sector and digital control systems, which, you know, everything from drones, smartphones, small aircraft, all these have kind of come together to a point today where we can start serving interesting missions uh, in this urban, you know, using this technology, putting it together to lead to a safe, sustainable transportation system in cities in the air that can save people time. Jeff, as you've designed the aircraft, built a pragmatic 
capability. For example, you said that the FAA would more likely certify sooner than later and hope for a mission. Or did the commercial people come to you and say, this is the mission that we need to have accomplished. Now build this capability towards this mission that we think is going to be most commercially viable. Yeah. So here at Archer, we have a, a whole team that's dedicated to analyzing how people move within cities. That has really been a where we couple that knowledge, and I can talk a little bit more about that in a minute here, with the state of the art on the aircraft side, you know, understanding what what the technology capabilities are. And we can iterate rapidly through lots of aircraft designs, see how they perform in this analysis of how people move around cities, and really figure out where there's the most most of a need for a vehicle like this. So this data science team that we have has built this tool that we call Prime Radiant. They take a look at anonymized cell phone data for how capturing trips in cities and you can then simulate mode choice models. So how how people decide how they wanna travel, right? If it's a short distance and they wanna walk, you know, if they're gonna take a car versus public transit, very much depends on the cost of each of those trips, where the origins and destinations are and people's time value of money. And combining that together, if you calibrate one of those mode choice models to how people actually travel in cities, you can also introduce a new mode like urban air mobility and that really gives you an understanding of which trips are most likely to convert to a service like this. And then also to optimize things like, where would you put the infrastructure in the city? What should the payload be? What should the range be? How fast should you fly? So some of those really top level aircraft uh, type requirements. So we've used this process and lots of iteration to arrive at the design requirements for our aircraft. And how sensitive is the aircraft design to changes in these high level macro hypotheses and trends? So in other words, yes, you can you can analyze the ground movement and patterns of people in urban environments, but until you actually introduce a new product into the market, you don't really know. You can you can guess how they will use it or or not use it. So as you push the first airplane into the market and generate learnings, how does that feed back into the design? Does the design incorporate enough margin to adjust for that learning? Yeah, so we we definitely are designing the airplane for the, the market where we think there's the most demand in the market. There will certainly be niches that are also interesting. So we've tried to design in the capability to the airplane where we can. Other thing is that this technology is still evolving. So there will certainly be future future upgrades to the aircraft that can provide, you know, as batteries improve primarily either more payload or more range. Right. So you mentioned that trade studies is one of the things that you enjoy the most. What are some of the most difficult design trades that you've had to make, either on the midnight or, or otherwise? Yeah. So for our midnight aircraft, I think there's a couple that, that come to mind. The first one is really around the, the system architectures. So both the high voltage system and our fly-by-wire flight control system. So by a system architecture for our high voltage system, this would be decisions about how many batteries do you have on the airplane, how many engines, and then the most important part is how are they all connected and what's the influence of that on meeting our, our safety targets and our performance requirements and how do you balance balance all of those. On the flight control system side, it's you know how many flight computers, how much redundancy in the sensing, how do you split up the uh, control surfaces, and how many actuators are there? And again, you know, what are the communications buses, uh, low voltage power for those systems? So they're, they're really intertwined, interconnected, multidisciplinary trades that are very interesting to, to work your way through. And I think the, the last one that really comes to mind that's a little more physical, I would say, is where to place the batteries in the aircraft. The batteries are a pretty large chunk of the takeoff weight, somewhere in the 25 to 30% range uh, for most eVTOLs. And this obviously has a large impact on the structural design of the aircraft, the center of gravity, and also how the center of gravity moves, you know, when you take payload in and out a little bit, it impacts the inertia of the vehicle, so the controllability. So we had a pretty extensive trade study there, and we, we think we came to a really good solution where we've placed the batteries in the wing, which has a lot of really unique benefits. So it, uh, much like you would put fuel in the wing, it provides some inertial relief for structural loads. It also, if you're if you don't have them in the fuselage, you have more space for your passengers and other systems. And from a safety standpoint, you're also keeping those battery packs uh, away from the passengers. Jeff, we've had some guests on who have kind of challenged the viability of batteries 
in this area. As you thought about the design of Maker and Midnight, have you considered at some point, should we go to more of a hybrid system rather than just batteries alone? One of the theses are around that when we started Archer was that we wanted to stick to pure battery electric. And there's a couple of reasons for that. The first one is from a pure sustainability standpoint and energy use. It's really hard to be battery electric when you're looking at energy use from the power grid to the prop shaft, right? That efficiency of that overall system, including the charging, discharging efficiencies, electric powertrain, et cetera. There are certainly other folks that are looking at hybrid with hydrogen or uh, traditional fuels. You pay a really large penalty. So first on the uh, traditional fuels, obviously you still have many of the same emissions that we have today, which doesn't really move us towards a more sustainable, significantly towards a more sustainable mode of transit. Additionally, from a weight perspective for those hybrid systems, you still need a battery pack. So it doesn't really buy you anything from a complexity of the certification process, for instance. There is the possibility to, to have more energy on board, but as we've talked about, we think there really are very valuable and interesting missions that can be done solely on batteries today. And then when we talk about hydrogen, I think the thing that's been a lot of recent focus on that is hydrogen in itself isn't, uh, you know, we don't go mine hydrogen. We have to use energy to create hydrogen either from water, get it from methane. So if it's, if it's not green hydrogen, there is still a carbon footprint associated with it. Even if it is green hydrogen, there's just a lot of wasted energy in that chain from the uh, uh, electrolysis, the compression, either to very high pressures or liquefaction of the hydrogen. And then you, when you run it through a fuel cell or burn it, at best, you're looking at around 50% efficiency. So it's just a lot of losses in that, that whole process. So if you're trying to reduce overall energy use, it doesn't buy you a whole lot. It may give you some more capability on the vehicle side, but the question is, do you need that for the missions that we care about? And we, we are pretty confident that the answer is you, you do not need that. So what changed the most in either your understanding of the trade space or the design of the midnight aircraft itself? You know, what were some of the key moments of insight along the way that influenced the design or how you think about the mission? As we've continued to look into those, those simulations, we've gained a lot of confidence in our, our vehicle requirements. So the desire to carry four passengers, uh, which is an increase from our demonstrator aircraft maker, which was designed, it only flies on man, but it was designed for a cabin to carry two up to two people. So the pilot plus four passengers came out of these, you know, this market analysis with our prime radiant tool. Also the need to, most of the demand lies in missions that are typically around 20 miles, but really in that 10 to 50 mile range. So that you know, we can focus on on that. We don't need to go push the, the range performance significantly. And then from a speed standpoint, it's really important that you fly reasonably fast, but you don't want to fly so fast that you start to pay other penalties on the aircraft. So the sweet spot seems to be somewhere around 100, 115, 120 knots, uh, where you're not paying significant penalties on the energy use. Or if you look at some of the regulations as your, your speed increases, it puts more constraints on your structure to meet flutter speeds, et cetera. It starts to drive up the weight as you want to fly faster. So there's kind of this sweet spot. If you fly too slow, you're not saving people enough time relative to other modes of transit, and then their willingness to pay for it will go down. So that's, uh, those are kind of the main insights. So when you design the aircraft, how much do you focus on the actual mission that you're describing versus the downstream effects of sustainment, maintainability, operations and being able to really recharge and use that aircraft throughout the day. Yeah, so those are all, uh, I would say, the next level of requirements that you get to once you kind of get, I like to call them the productivity requirements of the airline airplane, which is that payload range and speed. Then you start to look at some of the other uh, driving requirements. So things like the infrastructure footprint, turnaround time, we definitely take into account manufacturability, maintainability in the design of our aircraft. And there are certainly trades with performance for those things. So uh, an example I like to use is, you know, we're designing all of our wire harnesses so that they can be terminated off the airplane, right? You have fully produced connectors on both ends, and then you, you put them into the aircraft. You could save more weight if you installed the wires and then terminated them on either end, right? You don't need as big of pass-throughs through bulkheads and ribs and those sorts of things, but it would really complicate and 
make it much uh, much more difficult to manufacture the aircraft. Mm -hmm. So there's you still take those things into account for sure. Right. You mentioned Prime Radiant as one of the tools that you're using. What other design development or or just broadly otherwise, you know, this wargaming simulation kind of tools do you use regularly to ultimately zero in on the design and then even further evaluate the the mission and the concept broadly? And yeah. Yeah, what are, what are some of the, was this built in house? Did you go and buy this somewhere? Do you see that as an area of opportunity for people to innovate in? What's the state of the art? Yeah, so the, this Prime Radian tool is something that we built, uh, our data science team in house built that. And when it comes to designing the actual aircraft, we do use a mix primarily of, uh, I would say traditional industry standard design and analysis tools. Uh, we've also developed some of our own custom tools. so. On the aircraft side, for instance, uh, during the conceptual design phase, we developed a multidisciplinary optimization tool. So for an EV toll aircraft, it's really important to be able to see how different disciplines influence each other, right? Uh, a traditional example from an aircraft would be the wing design where you know, the thickness has an impact on the, the aerodynamics, but it also has a really big impact on the structure. So that's a, a simple disciplinary interaction that you wanna capture during those designs. But there's a multitude of others. Um, you know, we talked about putting batteries in the wings that puts constraints on the airfoil cross section to be able to fit them. So this tool that we developed captures a lot of those important interactions and allows us to design and size the aircraft at the conceptual level. So establishing things like rotor diameters, uh, the wing plan form area, the fuselage size, etc. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. So that, that was a tool that we developed customly, custom in-house. And then as we've moved into the preliminary and detailed design phases, it's getting a lot more into those traditional tools. So obviously CAD modeling tools, CFD for aerodynamics. So we've been utilizing a lot of the NASA, uh, NASA codes like Fun 3D and Overflow, finite element modeling for structural design, thermal modeling tools, electromagnetic analysis, uh, rotor dynamics. So all, all sorts of uh, I would say pretty traditional aerospace design and engineering mm -hmm. design tools. We've had guests previously on the podcast describing the digital engineering frontier and how it is being used in aerospace. To what extent have you used the digital environment to develop design and, and perhaps even to some extent test? Pretty much all of the design happens in a digital environment, I would say, whether that's, again, through our, our CAD tools that are managed in a product lifecycle management system. We use some model-based systems engineering to put together functional uh, diagrams, wiring diagrams, those sorts of things. And the really important part for us that we've been thinking about is having that single source of truth when we move from engineering to manufacturing as well. Our manufacturing engineering team is, you know, they have a digital factory environment where they can simulate the build of the aircraft before the first physical build. Are there any tools that you wish that you had or capabilities that you wish that you had previously? I can't say off the top of my head that there's anything that's major that's missing that we wish we had. I think the the biggest desire would be for these tools to be tied together more efficiently. Mm -hmm. So I think the the biggest lesson we've probably learned around this is the you know the effort required to set up and configure all of these tools. So things like the the product lifecycle management tool. It really needs to be customized for every everybody's use case. Uh, we have a you know a great internal team that does that, but it, it's a lot of work and it's taken a little bit longer than I would have expected. As you designed Bendai, what were some of the key assumptions and non-negotiable requirements that went behind the design? Yeah, so as I talked about before, one of the the key ones was that it would be battery electric powered. So as we talked about, that's the most efficient and what we see is the only fully sustainable solution today. The next related to that is that we wanted to use battery technologies that were commercially available today. So no no future battery tech that's not quite ready for production yet. The next was the that the aircraft had to be capable of vertical takeoff and landing. And you know, this is uh, traditionally it limits the performance of an aircraft when you impose this on it, right? You can look at Rotorcraft compared to aircraft performance when it comes to speed, range, or even you know like the V V twenty two would be a good example as well. Uh, but the reason we really wanted that VTOL capability is to reduce the infrastructure footprint. When you're looking at saving people time when they're traveling, it's really important to be able to start and end the flights close to their as close as possible to their origins and destinations to reduce that first and last mile time. So VTOL really enables that. And related to that is the the footprint of the vehicle. 
which in the rotorcraft industry and, and now starting to be in the EV tall industry is called the D value. You can think of it as the, the smallest circle that fully encompasses the aircraft. And the a lot of the FAA guidance on heliport or vertiport design scales off of that D value. So we've basically set that target at 50 feet for our aircraft because that's kind of the any larger than that, and you would have to start making the infrastructure bigger. If you get smaller than that, there are already requirements that the infrastructure has to be that big. The next key thing is that we've made the decision that the aircraft would be piloted from the beginning. And this was, again, getting back to our pragmatic approach to commercialization. We don't believe, and from what we've seen from the FAA, there's no clear path yet on how to uh, certify an autonomous aircraft. So we made the decision to start with a piloted vehicle. So starting from that basis and then working with the Prime Radiant tool that we talked about before, we established the productivity requirements for our airplane. The, the four passenger payload, 100, 120-ish knot speed, 150 miles per hour, uh, and then a range to be able to address those short missions that are in the 10 to 50 mile range, but at really high utilization. So the aircraft has a, a maximum range of up to 100 miles. Uh, but that allows us to do pretty quick flights of those shorter missions. You know, some companies say that they will start with a piloted aircraft and then move to autonomous aircraft as technology matures. How easy do you think it is to remove the pilot once a pilot has been designed into an aircraft? Yeah, so we took a, a long look at this in the past when I was working at A-Cubed. Uh, we've thought a little bit about it at Archer as well. I think we still need to see how some of the regulations uh, evolve. Uh, my view on autonomy, and uh, I think this is how, how Gamma has uh, put it as well, or a really nice framework to think about it, is you need to take all of the uh, responsibilities that a pilot has and then figure out how to conduct them either with somebody on the ground, have the aircraft itself perform that function, or a system on the ground perform the function. And it, it seems like for many of the functions that a pilot performs today, it'll be relatively straightforward to answer that question. And then for a few other ones, you know, there are, there are lots of solutions. And I think we need to wait for the regulatory path to see what the, the most efficient is. And then once those like high-level architectures are in place, you can then figure out what the impact is on the vehicle. I think from a core flight control system standpoint, I don't see a major impact. It's It's really around the the interface with the passengers and what you would, you know, traditionally say is your flight deck avionics. That's that's where the most change would occur. And some of the press that said that your the cost of the of the midnight ride will be similar to a, a ride sharing service. Kind of hard to believe that you can have a pilot and be that inexpensive. So as with any, you know, capital intensive business, the real key to to achieving low cost is to have relatively high utilization. So a real focus of our design has been to enable quick turnaround times for these relatively short flights. So, you know, you want to be able to, the flights need to be long enough to save people time, but also, and have large demand. So we, you know, we've really, again, seen that in the like 10 to 50 mile range trips, we can do turn times on some something on the order of 15 to 30 minutes. When you look at the overall direct operating cost uh, breakdown of the aircraft too, there's kind of a number of major buckets. There's the depreciation of the aircraft itself. There is the depreciation of the battery or the accruals of the battery. You know, if you have a fixed number of cycles, you're paying for a chunk of that with each flight. You have maintenance costs, you have pilot costs, the energy cost, although for these aircraft, the energy is a very, very small mm -hmm. percentage. Insurance, um, training. Yeah, insurance, there we go. That's, uh, and you can put the financing as along with the depreciation of the aircraft as well. Yeah, when you when you break these down, if you look at the cost of rideshare in a city like New York today, you might be paying four or five dollars per mile, and with pretty reasonable assumptions on all of these these elements, we can get uh, costs down into that range as well, and only expect them to improve with time as as well. What are some of the greatest dependencies on reaching some of these cost targets? Is it on the low costing the airframe itself or the batteries or? Yeah, so by far the biggest lever is the cycle life of the battery pack. That's uh can be if, if you, for instance, are using a new technology battery that may only get a couple hundred cycles, you're, you're paying a lot for it. If you're using some of the technologies like we are today where we're demonstrating multiple thousands of cycles uh, of these typical missions, the battery cost is actually not too bad, but that's, obviously a very key factor. The, the vehicle acquisition cost 
is not a, as big a driver as you might expect. It's not too different than, I would say, commercial aircraft. If you look at a direct operating cost breakdown, that's all, of course, assuming that you achieve that high utilization mm-hmm. since that, that kind of fixed cost is amortized over all your flight hours per year. And then the other big one is maintenance, right? So on a traditional aircraft, turbine, piston engines, like the vast majority of maintenance costs are associated with the engine or maybe not the vast majority, but roughly 50%. And when you move to an electric powertrain, you go from you know thousands of moving, hundreds or thousands of moving parts to essentially one moving part per electric engine. There's a really dramatic reduction in maintenance costs. Mm-hmm. And you can see this uh, looking at automotive data for electric cars versus uh, traditional internal combustion right. as well. You mentioned typically for an EV toll, a battery might be between you know, 25, 30, 35% maybe of the weight. What is the proportion of it in terms of the total cost? Relatively small, smaller than you would think. You know, the yeah. cost of a, a battery pack, like the cells aren't that much different than what's in an automotive, you know, in, mm-hmm. in a car. So the cell cost per kilowatt hour, low hundreds of dollars. When you compare that to the overall cost of a vehicle, it's a relatively small percentage. Yeah, which is why it was surprising to hear that one of the biggest levers is cycle life of those batteries. Yeah, uh, well, you can still, like, let's say, uh, making a round number here, say it cost $100,000. If you only got 500 cycles out of that pack, right, you're paying $200 per flight just for the battery, as opposed to if you got 5,000 cycles, you're paying $20 per flight for mm-hmm. that battery. So it can be a, a, a pretty big lever. Got it. Yeah, per flight. That's right. That's right. Yep. What about the utilization assumptions? At what point does the math work in terms of regional cost levels? You know, how many trips per day or whatever metric that you're using? So it, it definitely depends on the length of the trips, but for these, you know, 20 to 10 to 50 mile trips that we've been talking about, um, we're looking at upwards of 20 per day in terms of flight hours per year. I think this is something that will definitely, when services are initially launched, you're probably not going to see anywhere near the max utilization, but we expect that to, to grow. We're trying to target eventually something up in the neighborhood of uh, 2000 flight hours per year. Mm-hmm. And in a day, that's like a 10 hour or 12 hour operation. Yeah, with uh, you're only in the air about half the time. On the turnaround times, you said 15 to 30 minutes to turn the aircraft around. Yep. That's the assumption. What are some of the you know biggest contributors to to the turnaround process? Yeah, we actually this our data science team has done a really good job recently at combined with our systems engineering teams, putting down the process flow of what it takes to, to turn the aircraft. And it's pretty interesting. So for the longer missions, if you're flying 50 miles, it's really driven by the battery charging. For those shorter missions, it's some of the other tasks associated with you know the pilot walk around to the aircraft, loading people in bags, some of those getting people moving in and out of the aircraft and preparing the aircraft for the next flight that, uh, that adds up to, to limit the turnaround. Hey, Jeff, what does this certification process look like and what are some of the key gates? So at a, at a high level certification, is, you can kind of break it down into two primary phases. The first one is that you agree to and set the requirements with the regulator. And the second one is that you show that, that you meet those requirements uh, to ensure safety you know, the safety requirements are all met. And if we wanted to go into, you know, slightly more detail, the first phase when setting those requirements, there's the establishing the regulations. So this is captured in what's called the G1 issue paper. And then the next step is the means of compliance to those regulations. So this is where you get into more detailed design requirements. And our focus here is as much as possible using industry accepted standards where available. For instance, the ASTM standards recognized under part 23. And then you work through aspects that are new and novel with the FAA. Um, And then once those means of compliance are are completed, there are other documents like subject-specific certification plans. You eventually get into test planning. And then once you've produced parts, completed your company testing, then you go into the certification showing compliance to the FAA for them to to find compliance. Jeff, what do you think about the relatively recent pivot by the FAA in terms of uh, the basis for certification for EV tolls? I think the really important thing, at least from our standpoint, is that there weren't any significant changes to the, from an engineering standpoint, to those means of compliance. So it was not a large impact to my team for for designing to those. What are the differences in certification with the FAA versus EASA? Broadly, they're very similar with where we are for eVTOLs now. There are some minor differences. EASA has released their SC VTOL uh, special condition. And one of the key 
key differences that most people uh, point to in that SCV tall versus what's been published by the FAA is around the probability requirements for catastrophic failure conditions. So SCV tall specifies a 1e minus 9 per flight hour. So this is one in a billion flight hour as a you know maximum probability for a catastrophic failure condition for a vehicle that's uh, designed to carry people for hire under their category enhanced. Whereas the FAA put that target at 1e minus 8, so one per 100 million flight hours for fly-by-wire and associated systems. I think the something that's been interesting through our work is that we actually haven't seen that specific requirement driving many of our design decisions. One of the other criteria, uh, if you're going through the system development process and system safety process, is that if you're one failure away from a catastrophic failure condition, that also has to be classified as major. And that is what sets most of our architectural designs. And that requirement is the same between the EASA and the FAA. Can you explain that in a little bit more detail, how you approach safety and, and exactly what is this dynamic between major and catastrophic and how that feeds into certification requirements? Sure. So as we design the aircraft, uh, there's FAA uh, accepted documents for the, the development process uh, called ARP 4754A. So a, <laughs> uh, I think it's an SAE document <laughs> and a similar one for system safety uh, called ARP 4761. And as you go through uh, the safety process, there are a number of steps. The first is that you do a functional breakdown of your aircraft. So what does the air aircraft functionally have to do? What does each system functionally have to do? You then conduct uh, what's called a functional hazard Sorry, analysis. Can you, can you give us an example as you list through those? Sure. You know, so an aircraft function might be to, to be able to control thrust. And then a system, when you have a distributed propulsion system, a system level requirement for the flight control system might be you need to be able to command the thrust on every engine. So you start to get a little bit more specific in those functions. So then you go through and conduct what's called a functional hazard analysis, where you determine what happens to the aircraft if you lose that functionality. And depending on the severity of those, uh, the loss of the function, it gets assigned a probability and a design assurance level. So, you know, this example of a function of control thrust, if you're in hover flight, obviously, and you lose thrust on the aircraft, the aircraft will fall out of the sky. So that would be a catastrophic failure condition, and it would get assigned that uh, stringent probability requirement, either 1E minus 9. Um, from EASA or 1E minus 8 from the FAA. Uh, if you were in cruise flight and you lost thrust, it may be classified at a lower lower level, right? Because you could still glide the aircraft. So it might be major, it might be hazardous. So it'll be at a lower probability requirement. And I think the, the thing that's important here is you haven't yet designed the aircraft. So the, the point of this analysis is to help you design the system architecture so that you can meet that probability requirement. So for a, a vehicle like ours in Hover, you know, we have multiple independent battery packs, each connected to two engines, and the failure of any one of those systems does not cause the aircraft to lose thrust and fall out of the sky, right? So we meet that probability requirement through redundancy in this case. So as you get further into that safety assessment process, you conduct what are called preliminary safety assessments, and then eventually just the, the final safety assessment. And this is when you get into putting together fault tree analyses and uh, failure modes and effects analysis. And this is more of a, a bottoms up showing that the architecture meets those probability requirements that you established earlier in the, in the design process. With energy, what are some of the challenges today? What do you expect from the arc of future development? Yeah, so as talked about before, we don't see any major challenges today to meeting our mission requirements uh, using existing batteries. However, there are a lot of exciting battery technologies on the horizon. You know, many of these are still in the lab. A lot of companies are building prototype cells. We think, you know, the most promising technologies in the, I would say, the medium term, say five to 10 years out, are some of the lithium metal technologies and lithium ion with silicon anodes. So if you talk to Professor Venkat, this Vanathan from uh, Carnegie Mellon, you know, he'll he'll tell you that today they can produce th 350, 400 watt hour per kilogram cells compared to the 250 watt hour per kilogram today. You know, the real challenge over the coming years is going to be scaling manufacturing of those cells, improving their reliability, 
we, we like to call it the and problem with batteries. So it's not just the energy density. We also have requirements on providing power at low state of charge and low state of health to be able to do that vertical landing at the end of a flight. It needs to be capable of doing that over a wide range of environmental conditions. We need to meet those cycle life and cost targets to be able to make the economics work. So yeah, lots of interesting technologies. They just need time to mature and, and reach mass production. And if none of those occur, you're still able to meet the uh, the mission that you set forth. Uh, we're able to yeah meet the the mission like we've designed midnight around existing battery cells and the you know the performance that we've communicated is designed around those. We're not betting on any future battery breakthroughs. What about the state of the supply chain? Can you give us more context on as you're deep into this trade studies and design reviews? Do you find yourself needing to vertically integrate and develop certain enabling technologies in-house. What does the supply chain look like today and how do you expect it to evolve in the coming years? I would say at a high level that you know our ability to source critical components and technologies from these well-established suppliers is really a core part of our pragmatic approach to, to getting to commercial operations. So we've seen great responses across the board from suppliers who really see the tremendous potential in this market. So I think there's a really encouraging signals there. So, you know, as I mentioned before, we've announced some, some really key supplier partnerships with industry leading companies like Honeywell, Mecair for our landing gear, Molly Cell for our battery cells, Garmin, Hexel, uh, et cetera. And we've done a really good, you know, we have most of our bill of materials suppliers selected. So feeling really good about that. I think the areas where the supply chain is not as mature is in those areas of the emerging technologies, mainly around the battery pack integration. So not just at the cell level and then uh, electric engines. So those are, you know, key enabling technologies where we didn't see as robust of a supply base and we've pulled those developments in-house. What are some of the remaining areas that you feel entrepreneurs should be pursuing and innovating in? It's a good question. So I'd say first that it's, you know, it's definitely an exciting time in the industry with all these new technologies coming together that's focused on advanced air mobility, urban air mobility. Starting an aerospace business is definitely hard. Uh, you really need the right team and a lot of capital traditionally. So I think there still exists a lot of opportunities for tier one, tier two, tier three, really optimizing components for small fly-by-wire aircraft and bringing some of these existing technologies from other sectors up to the aerospace quality and certification uh, requirements. Jeff, you, your background is eVTOL. As traditional aerospace engineers come into your company, what are a couple of things you kind of say, no, this is an eVTOL, this is not your traditional commercial aircraft? So I would start by saying that I mean, we've built a fantastic team here at Archer. I think we've really pulled together this this really great mix of folks that come from traditional aerospace, folks with a Silicon Valley mindset, and as well as people from you know electrification, automotive industry. So it's it's really great to bring together all those different viewpoints and approaches to solving problems. And one of the key things we look for in in folks is to approach problems from the first principles. So saying this is how I've always done it before should not be the first or acceptable answer to uh, an engineering problem. There is certainly merit to it in many cases, but we really look for people to to understand the first principles and why. So I think for some some traditional aerospace folks, that's a little bit of a shock because it's, uh, hey, we've been doing this this way at my old company as long as we remember. But we really get in and say, hey, why is that? And again, there may be very good reasons for it, or we may say, hey, you know, here's some new technology, a new way of doing things. And this is the impact. Uh, we'll save X amount of weight. We'll save Y amount of dollars. And if it's worth it, you know, we'll go attack and try and get those savings. What would you say to those who are skeptical about the viability of the UAM use case and the ability to you know, bring the cause down uh, enough to uh, have eVTOLs really address a large part of the population? You know, a lot of people are naturally skeptical when there are new technologies that either they may not fully understand yet or aren't fully exposed to. It's one of those things that it's going to take time. I don't think we're kidding ourselves thinking that day one, we're going to be flying 15 hours a day with thousands of vehicles. It's, this is something that will you know, evolve over time. You can look at the electric vehicle industry. You know, 10 years ago, there were EVs being sold, but not a lot. And it's really grown a lot over the last uh, 
last decade. Same with the growth in technologies like solar, solar power. It's a, uh, it's a question of scaling in time. What do you think those gates to scale demand will be driven by? So I think the, I mean, the key is getting through certification and getting vehicles out into the world, people seeing their utility, uh, that they really can save people time, you know, reduce friction in their life. I think something we haven't talked about that really excites me, it's really hard to predict induced demand, right? You put to, put in a new transportation right. system, what new trips is this going to enable? Well, could change how, how cities grow. It could change definitely people's daily use patterns, right? I live in uh, the San Francisco Bay Area, not too far away from San Jose. If it's a Friday night and my wife and I want to go to San Francisco, like you might be sitting in traffic for an hour and a half. Instead, you could get there in 15 minutes. You may be a lot more willing to do it. It's really hard to model that sort of induced demand. That's the the really interesting and exciting part of this industry is we, we don't know what changes it'll bring. Two decades ago, if you talked about the iPhone, people wouldn't know what you were talking about, right? And look at how it's changed. The right. smartphone has changed the world today. Right. Your analog would be how do you use landlines or pay phones? Yep. And good luck trying to interpolate to, from, now you from can, that to now you can, you know, operate your, uh, you know, backyard cameras. You, know, you can, <laughs> yeah, you can uh, hail a hail irrigation a system, right? The sprinklers in the backyard with a phone. I mean, yep. When you speculate about the future and the different use cases and induced demand, you know, what's in the corner of your imagination? Uh, in terms of how EV tolls might be used in the future? It's a really good question. Again, enabling some of these trips you wouldn't otherwise take. I think the other interesting thing, you could imagine uh, communities growing up around a, a vertiport that's located a little, you know, allowing people to live a little, little further from urban centers. Can't remember where it's from, but some really interesting research, kind of the footprint of how long a person travels in a day hasn't really changed over human history, right? When you were Walking, you would your radius would be a couple of miles. You know, as cars have developed, it's it's grown obviously, but it could grow even larger with aircraft. Jeff, you if let's say Adam is going to an investor conference and he's only going to bring you, so it's just the two of you. <laughs> and investor gets up and says, Jeff, give me the basic differences between Archer and its biggest competitors. Where do you have the most distinct advantage? And then what would they say about you? Yeah, I. I would point back to our pragmatic approach uh, to com commercialization. So we're we're not trying to mm -hmm. invent new technologies where they already exist. Uh, we're really focusing our effort on those new and novel areas. I think along with that, we're not trying to push the boundaries. We're really focused on the economics of the vehicle. So we don't necessarily want to be the one that flies the farthest, the fastest, but we do want to be the one that's the most economical. Most of our competitors would probably point to the performance of their aircraft, so things like payload or range and speed primarily. Where you've decided that the the range and speed for your missions isn't quite as critical and doing it in an economic way is what's most important. Correct. Jeff, so we talked about designing, we talked about digital engineering tools and simulation. How far do you think the industry is from being able to to certify novel aircraft? in a digital environment completely? I think we're pretty far away from being able to completely certify uh, an aircraft in a digital environment. To show compliance to a lot of certification requirements, the regulators are still looking for testing as a method of compliance. And really it's analysis supported by testing. So you could, you know, a good example would be uh, loads on the aircraft. We have some tools that aerodynamic tools that predict the aerodynamic loads on the airplane, and you'll install strain gauges on your wings, and you'll go fly some test points and show that you can predict those well. You don't have to go fly every single test point and show that you predicted it well and that the aircraft is safe. But if you show that some, you can predict it well in a lot of, you know, a number of points throughout the envelope, then you can show that you meet the requirements by analysis for the other ones, as an example. Um, so I think it's going to be really hard to get away completely from some testing, but we definitely want to leverage simulation as much as we can to re reduce the amount of uh, flight testing that's required. But yeah, again, don't think we'll we'll ever be able to eliminate it entirely. Jeff, if you fast forward five years, what does the industry look like? And then the same for the 10 year mark. Yeah, so I think in, in five years, I really believe we'll, we'll begin to see the expansion of ur urban air mobility networks into, 
I would say most of the major cities in the U.S. I would expect at least two companies to probably have FAA certified EV tolls at that point. Uh, and it, at Archer, we really believe that those early routes will probably be what we call trunk routes between airports, city centers. Uh, you know, similar to the one we, the first route we just announced recently with United um, from Newark Liberty International Airport to the downtown Manhattan heliport. Let's see. Then as we get closer to ten years out, I think and. We'll see a growth in obviously the number of vehicles that are operating and probably start to see in those initial cities, the networks start to expand. So getting more nodes, what we call branch routes into those cities, and then probably see operations start to extend to uh, some new cities as well. And then I would guess also in that 10 year time frame is around when we'll start to see new certified battery packs. So we might see some extended range and payload capabilities. Cool. Jeff, what's your favorite movie? Uh, I don't know that I have a favorite movie. I think the favorite movie from this past year was actually Top Gun. Uh, we went to go see that as a, (laughs) as a company, which was really fun. Uh, Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Nice. Very unpredictable. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) What what advice would you give to someone who wants to start a business in advanced air mobility? I don't know. My background's really on the engineering side. Yeah. So it's definitely definitely an exciting time to to be involved with UAM Advanced Air Mobility. So uh, I think, as I mentioned before, starting a, a business in aerospace is hard, uh, but again, with the right team and, and capital, it's it's certainly possible. And you know, here at Archer, we're always looking for great people. So if if any of your listeners are interested in uh, new opportunities, they can visit our our career site. So archer.com slash careers. What do you think are some of the most common misconceptions about urban air mobility? Yeah, there's a couple that we hear. I think the the first one we've talked a bit about about already, which is around the battery technology and that it doesn't exist to fly meaningful missions. You know, we've shown and convinced ourselves that uh, with commercially available cells today, we can fly these interesting, uh, what we believe will be profitable missions. The other misconceptions I think are around noise. With these electric aircraft and different configurations, we can actually do quite a bit to drive down the noise. So, you know, for an aircraft like Midnight, when it's flying overhead in cruise, it should blend into the background. You won't be able to hear it. Takeoffs and landings will certainly be a little bit louder, but still significantly quieter than existing rotorcraft, which is, you know, we think is really necessary and a a strong requirement to be able to operate these vehicles in cities. And then the last one we've also talked quite a bit about, which is cost. So we do believe that as the industry scales, we will be able to drive ticket prices down similar to vehicle, you know, automotive rideshare levels today. That's a great way to summarize the podcast, frankly. I was just going to ask you if you wanted to leave the audience with one point, what would it be? Yeah, I would say that, uh, you know, the technology really does exist today. And we really have this unique opportunity to change change how people uh, move in and around cities in a way that's safe, quiet, quick, sustainable, and uh, not too expensive. That's great. I've learned a lot about Archer today, Jeff. I'm I'm even more impressed. You have a, a practical, pragmatic approach. So it's very impressive. Thank you. Yeah, you look anything else you. from you? Really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff, for carving out a little bit of time to speak to us. Yeah. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Luca. It was a real pleasure. All right, that's a wrap for today. Thank you for listening to the Vertical Space Podcast. Reach out if there are topics that you would like us to discuss and goodbye until the next episode. Unless mentioned, this podcast is in no way endorsing or promoting any person and or company mentioned and all opinions within the podcast are solely that of the presenters. The Vertical Space makes no guarantees, warranty or representation of any information given in this podcast. Any information given is for informational purposes and should be used at your own risk. This podcast is for general educational and entertainment purposes only.